Hi, I'm Pierre, and I will talk about privacy budget scheduling. This is joint work with Tolio, Minian Pan, Azaf Sidon, Roxana Jambasu, and Mathias Lecuyer. More precisely, I will talk about data protection for machine learning workloads. Let me start with an example. Consider a messaging application. We have users who are generating sensitive data, such as private messages. So I don't want you to be able to read my private messages, so that's why we usually implement access control mechanisms. And this is straightforward with traditional code. However, modern applications increasingly rely on machine learning, in addition to traditional code. For instance, we might want to provide some text completion functionality for our applications. We might also want to train a recommender system or to run some ad targeting. So all these machine learning models are trained on user data. Then they are used to issue prediction for users, or even in some cases, we might release the models publicly. The problem is that machine learning models can, train a lot, can learn a lot. And of course, they can learn about general trends in the population, which is what we want. However, models can also, mem can also memorize information about individual users. And with privacy attacks, these models can leak a lot of sensitive information. For instance, if you train a language model on user data, an adversary can use it to recover data, such as the social security number or the address of some users. And there are a lot of attacks for different types of models. So we would like to have something like access control, but for machine learning. And it's a bit less straightforward how to, to implement it. One solution is, dif is differential privacy. So differential privacy can be used to prevent privacy attacks, but we should apply it at the right level. Let me explain that a bit more. So privacy attacks work by finding data points that make a given observed model or its predictions more likely. And differential privacy, or DP, can prevent these attacks by making sure that no single data point can drastically increase the likelihood of a given model. On the right is the formal definition of differential privacy, and you can see that it's a stability constraint for randomized computations. And the increase in likelihood of a given output is controlled by this parameter, epsilon, and it's called the privacy loss. So we have this tool, differential privacy, that we can use to protect individual models. If you are training uh, the autocomplete model with differential privacy, with a given parameter epsilon 1, an adversary can't extract too much information from, the, from that model only. And the other models are protecting, protected as well, when we consider them separately. However, in aggregate, an adversary can still recover a lot of information. This is because the privacy loss accumulates. It means that releasing multiple models trained on the same data amplifies the attack surface, even if you are using differential privacy for individual models. The issue is that most DP algorithms focus on individual models and static databases. But in practice, ML systems run workloads. It means that we accumulate more sensitive data over time as users join the system and generate more data. We also want to train new models on the same data, or we might want to retrain all models over and over again with new data. So what can leak in this case? Well, actually, if we release too many models, we can basically allow an adversary to reconstruct the whole database. The solution to avoid that is to use differential privacy at a workload level, to give global privacy guarantees, even for users who will join the system later. DP has good, good theoretical properties, such as composition theorems. So enforcing global DP guarantee means having a global privacy budget, epsilon g, that ML tasks can consume over time. This is why privacy should be a compute resource, alongside CPU, GPU, or RAM. That means that you, can, you, ha you have to ask for some privacy before you can run your computation. Because privacy is so limited, we should schedule it efficiently and fairly. And the natural question is whether we can reuse existing algorithms for scheduling and what properties in terms of fairness and efficiency as concerned are our concern for privacy. That's why we built Private Cube. It's an extension for Kubernetes, a workload orchestrator. Private Cube adds privacy as a new resource directly alongside compute resources. We incorporate a new scheduler called Dominant Privacy Fairness, or DPF which is a variant of Dominant Resource Fairness, DRF, adapted for privacy. And DPF enjoys the same fairness properties as DRF, with a few, a few changes because of the unique nature of the privacy resource. Let me explain how it works. 
So we want to run our workload on an orchestrator. On the left, we have standard resources, such as CPU or RAM. So Kubernetes, for instance, already knows how to manage that. On the right, we add support from, for privacy. So we split our sensitive data stream into private data blocks alongside a public attribute, such as time or increasing user IDs. So each block is a different resource. And as time goes on, we are going to add new blocks to the system with fresh privacy budget. When pipelines arrive in the system, they formulate, they formulate two types of demands. First, the compute demands that are handled by Kubernetes, and then the privacy demands, which are handled by the privacy scheduler. So here, this pipeline is only asking for some budget over a pretty old block, maybe to run some statistics uh, to index the database. Later on, other pipelines might, might ask for budget for different blocks. For instance, this one is asking for more budget uh, over more blocks, because maybe it's heavy and heavier model to train. And finally, you might have uh, a pipeline that only wants fresh data. So you can see that every time we consume some privacy, we keep track of it in the privacy resource. And you can also note that the privacy is a multidimensional resource, in the sense that each, each pipeline is going to ask for a demand vector for privacy. Let's see how this black box here, the scheduler, works. The first idea would be to reuse an existing algorithm for multidimensional resources. Dominant Resource Fairness, or DRF, is a popular algorithm for locating multiple heterogeneous compute resources, such as CPU, GPU, or RAM. And it gives maximum fairness over M resources. Let's recap how DRF works. So we have multiple resources with fixed capacities. Then, every time a new job arrives, we sort all the jobs, and we try to allocate the smallest first until we can't allocate any more jobs. That's why we get maximum fairness, which is maximizing the smallest allocation. But what does smallest mean here? To compare jobs in a multidimensional setting, we use the notion of dominant share. The, domi the dominant share of a job is simply the highest coordinate of the domain vector. The problem is that privacy doesn't behave like a CPU. It's not replenishable. For instance, if you have a job that takes one hour to run on your CPU, once the job is done, you can just reuse the CPU to run a different job. However, if you are running a computation that is going to use some privacy budget, you can't reuse the same privacy budget later. So for instance, in this example, we might have uh, pipelines, so two pipelines that are asking for some budget over block one and block two. So if we allocate them like DRF would do, we we'll just uh, uh, try to maximize the smaller allocation and allocate them all and consume the budget. But then, if we do that, we won't have enough budget left for future pipelines, even if they were actually smaller than the initial pipelines. This is why we introduce Dominant Privacy Fairness, or DPF. And the main idea of DPF is to, un is to unlock privacy budget for each block progressively, to make sure that we always have some budget for the future. So we start with zero unlocked budget, and every time a pipeline arrives, we unlock one over n fraction of the remaining budget. So n is a parameter. It means that once n pipeline arrived in the system, we unlocked all the budget. And then after that, we're just going to try to uh, do best effort scheduling. Finally, we just run DRF on this, uh, after this modification with uh, one other, another change here, which is that we can only consume from unlocked budget instead of consuming from the total budget. Let me give you an example to show it works in practice. So let's take these two blocks and uh, pipelines. So when pipelines arrive, we unlock some budget corresponding to their fair share. So in this case, the pipeline is too large to fit in the unlock budget, so we can't allocate it yet. We just, we're just just going to keep it in the queue for a while. Later on, if a new pipeline arrives, we are going to unlock more budget. Then we are going to sort the queue according to the dominant share. So we are going to put the smallest pipeline first and try to allocate it. Finally, once a new pipeline arrives, we are going to sort them again. In this case, they are, have the same dominant share, so we are going to sort them with the second dominant share and try to allocate them. So that's how it works. And that's how we can guarantee maximum fairness, but only for the first n pipelines. So on the right, you can see that we have to modify the definition of fair domain pipeline a bit to account for the fact that privacy is not replenishable. 
And finally, with this change, we can guarantee similar properties as the array. Let's see how DPF works in practice. In the paper, we address three main questions, which are first, how does DPF compare to baseline schedulers, such as first come first serve or run robin? Then, how do workload characteristics impact DPF, such as whether it's homogeneous or not? And finally, how does the DP semantic impact DPF? To answer these questions, we develop two workloads. The first one is a simplified experiment with only four types of pipelines either small epsilon or large epsilon, and one block or 10 blocks. The second workload is a macro benchmark with real data from Amazon reviews with NLP pipelines and statistics in order to have a wide range of demands. Today, I'm just going to focus on the first question over the micro benchmark. So here is the allocation of DPF versus two baselines. The first baseline is first come first serve. It's just going to try to allocate the, pi the pipeline as soon as it comes. On the x-axis, you have the end parameter for DPF. And on the y-axis, you have the number of pipelines allocated. So up is good. You can see that first come first serve has quite poor performance. It doesn't allocate that many pipelines. The other baseline is run robin. So run robin is just trying to unlock budget over time and give it fairly to all the pipelines in the system. So at first, it seems to work slightly better than first come first serve before collapsing. Why? Because if we release budget too slowly, after a while, we will just waste budget on pipelines that will never be able to run because they don't have enough budget. You can see that DPF outperforms both first come first serve and run robin because it never wastes budget and also because it prioritizes smaller pipelines. However, we can see that this higher allocation comes at a cost in latency. Indeed, this is the CDF of the scheduling delay. On the x-axis, we have the uh, length of the delay with the timeout, because indeed, the delay just plateaus at some point. Because once you have some number of pipelines allocated, you can't allocate any more because you just run out of privacy budget. You can see that that first come first serve plateaus very quickly, because all pipelines are either allocated immediately or never allocated. However, it doesn't, it doesn't allocate that many pipelines. When we use DPF with higher values of n, we can allocate more pipeline, but we have to delay them a little bit, wait for some budget to be unlocked before we can allocate them. Finally, for a large value of n here, we can allocate even more pipeline, but we have to wait much more before we can allocate them all. Indeed, we have to unlock the budget quite slowly to make sure that we can uh, give some budget to the smaller pipeline that will come in the future. So that's how we can trade off latency for more allocation. Currently, machine learning workloads consume user data and privacy without accounting. This is dangerous in the context of evolving privacy attacks against machine learning. This is why we must start treating privacy as a resource. Or precisely, privacy is a scarce resource that we should carefully track and schedule. And we can do that thanks to differential privacy and its composition properties. With private cube, we incorporate privacy as a new type of resource directly into Kubernetes. We also provide dominant privacy fairness, the first scheduling algorithm for the privacy resource. The changes to this algorithm and the fairness definitions show that scheduling privacy is a new problem. And there is much more work to be done to make the best use of this limited resource, users' privacy. Thank you.